psalms are where our souls can soak up the written colors God has poured through his spirit to paint on the canvas of our hearts. Psalms are the literary sanctuary of the scriptures. As we soak up the psalms, know that we as Christ's church are entering into what we call the divine art gallery where he loves to meet with us both corporately and personally. Good morning, brothers and sisters. Good to see you this morning. I am glad to be here with you, and I'm glad and for the privilege to be able to open up God's word with you. Uh, we are in Psalm 28 today. If you're not there yet, uh, please turn to your Bibles or go to it on your device, and we are going to jump into Psalm 28. As you're making your way there, two things. One, uh, this marks the end of the Summer Psalm series. I know, that's why I had the same thought, that we have come to the end of summer. And so uh, it's a sad day, but God has much in store for us. Uh, if you were with us last week, uh, many, of you, many of you remember I shared a story to start it off. Uh, if you were not here, here's a quick update. So uh, just a few weeks ago, my family and I were on vacation, and one of the things on my bucket list was to go bungee jumping. And so I did, uh, I jumped off a bridge and it was totally exciting. And that caused all kinds of conversations to happen amongst you. Uh, I'm glad for the privilege to do that. Uh, but what I was not prepared for was the follow-up question. Okay, not whether you're gonna do it or not, but the follow-up question from which I've heard from a number of you is, is how did you get down? Okay, because remember, when you jump off a bridge, uh, you do bounce and you do swing, and then eventually you come to rest upside down, and the question naturally then is, how do you get down? Well, getting down may have been more crazy than jumping off the bridge in the first place. Okay, because before you jump, before you jump, they say, okay, okay, make sure you jump out, you're going to bounce, you're going to swing. And then when you get down to the bottom, then as you're hanging upside down, what you have to do then is the only way to get down is to help yourself. Okay, well, how am I going to do that? Well, you got to reach up there and yank. And then you let go. And you go, there's no way. There's no way possible that what you just said is true. And you're actually right. That's not true. Because it doesn't make any sense. If you're hanging upside down by your feet... How is it, how do they expect you to be able to help yourself get out of the situation? The thing about it is, is that there's a lot of times where we believe that's true, right? That we find ourselves in a situation and we believe or we begin to think the only way out of this is if I do something about it. Amen? Okay, so we're going to stop for a second and go, we have to understand that that is not truth. Okay, all of us have heard the, heard the thing, God helps those who help themselves. Get that out of your head. Get that out of your belief system. Right? Because there is no way that I was going to be able to unclip or do anything to myself as I'm hanging there upside down. Okay? What I had to do, you know how I got down? Is I had to reach out for the hand. I'll show you this picture. <clears throat> this is how you get down. So you're hanging there upside down, and as you come to an end, then uh, one of the minions who are there to assist you, they come rowing out on this little inflatable boun tram bouncy trampoline. And you can notice, I think, that uh, as you're there, they reach this pole out, and on the pole is a hand. And the only way to get down is to grab the hand. And as you grab the hand, then what happens is that he pulls you down close, unhooks you, and lays you gently on the trampoline. That's how you get down. And then he paddles you back to the shore, and it's all over. Now, I share this with you, one, because it's a fun story. Two, because ultimately there's part of me that wants to convince some of you to go bungee jumping. But greater, but greater is this, is that this is a picture of what's happening in Psalm 28. Is that what is happening is David has found himself in a place that he can't get out of on his own. He cannot help himself. And so what he is attempting to tell us 
in Psalm 28 is that you need to reach out your hand and grab the hand because there is someone who can help. And so today, that's where I hope to go. Uh, Psalm 28 is this. As he says, and he starts off, he says, Lord, I call to you. Lord, I call to you. Now, we've talked about that these last few Psalms, Psalm 26 and 27, if you haven't had a chance to listen, I encourage you to do so. Uh, There is a thread that runs through these three, 26 and 27 and 28. Okay, this thread that runs through this trio of Psalms is this, is that it's an access to the Lord's house. Okay, what he's doing in each of these in slightly different ways is talking about the idea of the desire to be with God in his house. In Psalm 26, we saw that there is an integrity and a sincerity that's demanded by God for him to have that privilege to go in. And what he says is to gain access there requires those two things. In Psalm 27, last week, what we saw was that it's that the the Lord's house is a place of sanctuary. It's a place of safety from enemies, and it is the place where he could meet face to face with God. And so in Psalm 28, then, what we find now is that this is David's prayer of petition. And what we'll see is where he's going to be directing that to. And what he sees then at the very end is not only is he praying for help, and he's crying out to God, but that he's also praising him for answered prayer. And we're going to expand that a little bit in a little bit. So yes, this is a Psalm of David. Okay, again, as we've continued through. Uh, This is also a song of lament. Okay, and we often think, and we've talked about this on and on for the last few weeks, even through the summer, that these are lament psalms. And when we think about the word lament, we always think about sadness or we think about sorrow, some of on the negative scale of emotion. But remember, with a lament in scripture, it does include that as part of it, that there is a plea to God for help, there is a complaint, there is confession of sin or innocence. But Wrapped around that is a cry out to God and a plea for him to help. And then also there's a confidence that comes in his response and a blessing. And you see all of those elements there in Psalm 28. And so this is a true biblical lament where, yes, there is sadness, but yes, it's wrapped up with this confidence that God is going to answer. And we need to hear that today, right? Because even in the video, the testimony video from camp, right, you hear our youth there are, there are some in certain situations where it just feels like sorrow all of the time. You may be in the same place. But let us, like David before us as our example, see that, yes, that is, that is part of the human experience. But as part of the human experience also is that there comes this confidence in a God who is the one reaching out the hand, who is able to do what we need to and provide the security and help that we need. Okay, so this is Psalm 28. And so the truth then that we find here is as we seek the face of God with prayers of petition, our pleading should transform into a proclamation of praise when God hears us and answers our cries. I say this because uh, we uh, oftentimes will get to the first part about the pleading for help. That we say, God, there's something that I cannot face on my own. I'm in this situation, okay, that I am competent in myself, that I've been taken care of, but this thing is too big for me. And so oftentimes we get to that place. And so many of us, if we had time just to stand on the stage and give testimony of testimony of finding ourselves in those places and God answering. But what I want to point out and what I want to challenge us with this morning is that we're not often so good at getting to the second part about the praising God for the answering. And what I want to see, we'll walk through as we walk through the psalm, why that is. Because what it is, is is that we want God's help and we get God's help, we forget to thank God for his help. And it's in those very things that we're declaring the Lord's goodness to those around us. And missing that step means missing an important part of what God wants to teach us. And so here, we find ourselves, there's three parts. The psalm breaks down pretty easily into three parts. 
I looked at it as aspects of a prayerful petition. That's just a cry out to God. The first is this, is that we should plead with God to hear our cries. I mentioned and I just read verse 1. It says, Lord, I call to you. He follows that up with, my rock, do not be deaf to me. If you remain silent to me, I will be like those going down to the pit. We see incorporated now a new name. Okay, last week, if you remember, we talked about that David in Psalm 27 says, God, the Lord is my light. The Lord is my salvation. The Lord is my stronghold. And I don't know, I hope that at some point this week that those things, you reminded of those things, that yes, the Lord for you also is your light in the darkness that you're facing and the darkness that's around you, that he is our salvation because of what Christ did on our behalf, that he is our salvation so eternally I'm secure, that he is our stronghold, that he is that fortress I can run into and it does not matter what batters. It does not matter what comes against it or what enemy stands against it, that we can be safe. And now David says that also that he is my rock. A rock, again, is something that we can stand on. It's firm. It's a sure foundation. We were saying about it in the song today, that it is stability. It's security. But what I want you to understand this is that oftentimes, oftentimes in our life, we will say that we have someone who is a rock for us, right? When we're going through, when we're going through a troubling situation, you, we may have, you may have a mentor, you may have a best friend, you may have a spouse, you may have a close friend, you may have a, a church family member who, when you're talking about this person, you'll say, man, they are my rock. They're my rock. Because when I'm, when I'm not stable and I'm uncertain, they are just, they are, they are something that I can latch on to and be held to. And that's an appropriate thing. But scripturally, no person is ever called rock. Because if the honest thing is that no one can maintain that, right? Because we're all beset by sin. We're frail. We all have times where we're not strong and where we can't be a rock that we're limited. But when David cries out and says, my rock, what he's really doing is he's saying that God is the rock. He is my rock. He is the one who will always provide a sure foundation. I will always be stable in him. You see, rock in scripture is always designated and reserved for God, not for man. And so today we need to understand God as we, he is our rock. In fact, Paul recognized this when he was talking to the Corinthian church in 1 Corinthians 10. And he, as he was looking backwards at the wilderness generation, what he was doing is he's saying is that what they were doing at that point was that they were drinking from the spiritual rock that followed them. And what he says then is that rock was Christ. And so the rock is not just God that David worshipped. It's also as we look back through redemptive history, through Christ, that Jesus too is our rock. He is the one spiritually that we drink from who provides the very things that we need. And so if you're here this morning and feel unstable, uncertain, like it's teetering, like you don't know which way you're gonna fall, let me remind us of who you have in Christ. And it is the rock. That all of you in Christ have access to him as such. And so let's stand confidently there. So when David cries out to this, notice he does not demand God's attention. He does not demand God as if he deserves God to hear him. He does not come like a celebrity and go, hey God, okay, it's me speaking, it's David, you know, I'm like the man, I'm like the guy on earth. And so therefore, because of my position, because of my reputation, because of what's going on here, you should be listening to me because I've got the special phone number with you. He doesn't do that. He does not demand anything as if he was entitled to God answering his prayer. But what he says by saying, Lord, I call to you, don't be deaf. And then what will happen if he doesn't is really what he's doing is he's requesting God to hear him on the basis of mercy and grace that God is extending. 
And so in this too, there's also a real possibility that's indicated by David that God may choose not to listen. And so he comes with this passionate cry. You see, the passion part is, notice all the sounds that you see, all the focus on sound. You see here in verse one, I call to you. Okay, you see, don't be deaf. So there's a, there's a muting of sound. Uh, a remaining silent, again, not speaking back. In verse two, it says, listen to the sound. Of my, and then he says, followed up with pleading. And then he says, when I cry to you, so that's the passion that he comes. He doesn't come and go, um, hey, God, so if you, um, um, if I kind of need something, you know what I'm saying? Like, he doesn't come shaky. He's coming like, God, I need you right now. I don't know what I can do if you don't. See the passion that comes? And so again, this is good as, as we think of, as, as we're kind of, have this listening spot, like we're a fly on the wall of David's prayer room. And as we hear him, he's just pouring out himself. I ask us the question, is that the way that you pray? Do you pray with the boldness coming before God to say, God, I need you to listen because there's nothing else that I need or else I can do right now. Do you pray with that kind of boldness? Or do you just kind of pray half-heartedly kind of wondering, I don't even know if he's going to answer, if he cares about answering, if he hears me. How do you pray? Let David's example show us about how we should, that we can come seeking the face of God, pouring our heart out with pleading, with cries and sounds, that he says that I can't go anywhere, so you're the answer for me. We talked about last week that confidence is putting, putting our full confidence, our full trust in a person. And that's what David is doing here. You see, if he says that if he doesn't, if he's, if he's deaf or if he's silent, so if he can't hear or won't respond, he says, what is going to happen to me? I'm going to be like those who go down to the pit. Okay, again, pit is the Old Testament place of the dead, the shoal. Okay, and so he said, I'm going to be worse than dying. Okay, it's going to be worse than that. But it's because those who go there are facing judgment. And so there's, he doesn't want to be treated in the same way as the wicked do. And he says, God, I need you to answer so that I don't have to be assigned to the same place as all those who have, who have rejected and rebelled against you. He says, I need to go. I want you to answer. And then he says, as he's pleading and as he's crying, then he says, when I lift up my hands. I was thinking about this week, right? that lifting up our hands is actually a sign of quite a few different things. You see it as an expression of prayer. Uh, some of you today are lifting hands in worship. And so really what it is, it's a reaching out to God when you lift your hands. But I also was thinking there's three other things that lifting hands express. One, that lifting your hands is a position of surrender right? Okay, so if, if you decide to uh, go against the law and the police come for you, I surrender. Okay, if you have the unfortunate experience of being held up, hands up. It's a place of surrender. But not only is, is hands up a position of surrender, it's also a position of solace. What do I mean by that? Anyone ever see a young child who wants to be picked up? What do they do? Hands up, right? That this is a sign of a solace because a sign of solace is that where I want to be is in your arms. And so therefore, I want to express that to you by lifting my hands. And who do you know who, when you see a kid lifting their hands up, won't automatically reach down and pick them up? David says, that's the position I'm taking. So it's a position of surrender. It's a position of solace. And really, when we lift hands up, it's also a position of security. Because notice this. When I do this, what am I communicating? Self-protection. And no desire for whatever it is that you want that you're offering. Opening this 
makes, my, makes me very vulnerable. Okay, I'm no longer self-protecting. And so David is saying all of these things. So when we see hands up, what we're really saying is, okay, God, I just, I don't want to be self-protecting anymore. I, I'm relying on you. God, I want to be with you. I want to be held by you. And that I'm surrendering everything that I think I should want or need in the way that I want it. I'm surrendering to you. And so, again, he's saying he's not reserving anything for himself. He's simply, he's simply saying, okay, I'm letting it I'm letting go, God, because it's you that I need. And so when we think about this, we think, wow, why don't I do that? Am I not desperate enough that I'm willing to lift my hands up and say, God, I, I need what you, only what you can provide? Am I not desperate enough? Am I not willing? Or am I so prideful that I still think that I can get along, he just needs to help me out a little bit? David is saying, I'm so desperate, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna say, okay, God, you're gonna have to do this. And we too need to be there. You'll find if you take, if you look later in 1 Timothy 2.8 that this was actually adopted by the New Testament church. That Paul to, to Timothy, and ultimately it's church in Ephesus, he says that when men are gathering, they should lift their hands in, in prayer with one another. And I often think, I go, wow, are we missing out on something when it comes to worship? When when we simply come, we may stand because that's comfortable, but are we really missing out on something when, when, we, when we don't lift our hands in praise, we don't lift our hands in prayer, and we don't lift our hands in worship, are we really missing out on something? And that's something that I just lay before us to really consider and challenge. Again, because David is showing this, but because if, if Paul is encouraging Timothy and the church to do that, then why don't we? Is it just a cultural thing? Or are we really saying this is something that we need to work into? That as crossover church, not any other church in other place, but just us as this gathering of believers to simply say, God, okay, we are desperate as a people. And are we desperate enough to go, okay, I'm willing to lift my hands. And it doesn't matter if people look at me weird or strange or funny. Like, it doesn't matter what my friends think. It doesn't matter if someone laughs even. That I am gonna, I'm going to seek you and search you so much that I'm willing to lift my hands. And so he says that he's lifting up his hands. But notice that, that he's lifting up his hands not just kind of generally anywhere, but that the direction actually is directed to a very specific place. At the end of verse two, he says, he's lifting up hands to holy sanctuary. Okay, and we mentioned it last week. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit more today that when he's talking about holy sanctuary, he's actually talking about the holy of holies. Okay, and so once again, I just wanna quickly describe, and then we're gonna spend a couple of minutes here in Hebrews. And, and so the Holy of Holies, again, was that place in the tabernacle. Okay, if you're unfamiliar with tabernacle, it was the tent that God designed for Moses and the people to have. Okay, it was a place that God set up very specifically. Okay, it was a place where his presence actually dwelt. Okay, and so it was this inner, inner area, okay, that only the high priest was allowed to go into. And so when David is talking about that he's lifting his hands toward his holy sanctuary, it's not just in a general direction to the church, but he's, what he's doing is he's saying, I'm directing my attention, my focus, my arms being lifted up, I am directing it directly to the very place where God's presence was dwelling at that time. Just a general area wasn't enough. He said, I need to be so specific and so pointed that I want to be directed to the very presence of where you are, where you meet with your people. And so that's where we look because it's right there that the mercy seat was found. 
And so let's take a little side note and let's go to uh, the book of Hebrews. Book of Hebrews, and we're going to start, we're going to look at two passages. Uh, we'll start first in chapter 9 in verse 1. Okay, and so uh, if you're familiar, Hebrews is one of those books uh, where it feels so overwhelming. But if you read Hebrews consistently, what you find is that it's actually an amazing book. Because what's going on in Hebrews is that the writer of Hebrews is simply saying, okay, this is Jesus, and this is how Jesus is higher than the angels, that he is the great high priest, and that he's fulfilling all of these very specific functions. And when you see it in that regard, you go, whoa, okay, this is, this is pretty amazing. And it's in this section, what he's talking about is the sanctuary. And why I want us to be just generally reminded, or if this is the first time you've ever heard it, to be exposed to this. Because we live in an age right now where uh, even, in, even in the church, that the, the Old Testament is being relegated to antiquity. Okay, it's being left behind. It's being ignored. And if you do that, you are undermining this whole of Scripture, Okay, and so as, as Bible believers, as Christ followers, as evangelical Christians today, the whole counsel of God's word is essential and important. And that way, we need to understand so that when the writer of Hebrews goes, we understand Jesus, but to understand Jesus in this way, we got to go back to Old Testament. We need to understand all of it. And so that's why what he's doing, the writer of Hebrews here, is he's staring back at Exodus, at the very thing that God has established. Okay, so let's look at chapter 9, verse 1. He says, now, first covenant also had regulations for ministry and an earthly sanctuary. For a tabernacle was set up, and in the first room, which was called the holy place, were the lampstand, the table, the presentation loaves. Behind the second curtain was a tent called the Most Holy Place. It had the gold altar of incense and the Ark of the Covenant, covered with gold on all sides, and which was a gold jar containing the manna, Aaron's staff that budded, and the tablets of the covenant. So much there. If you want a great Bible study, take that verse and go back and start to look. Because what you're going to find is that it points to Christ. i got to leave it. Okay, so we got to keep going. Okay, the cherubim of glory were above the ark, overshadowing the mercy seat. It was not possible to speak up of these things in detail right now. Even the writer of Hebrews had to leave it because there's so much there. But what he's saying is in this was the ark. That's what they carried with them. That was the presence. It actually drove enemies away because they carried that thing into battle. And it says, on that was the mercy seat, and the, the, the cherubim overshadowed that. And so when David is saying, I am lifting my hands in surrender to the God who has come down to dwell with man in this holy of holy place. He says, where the mercy seat is found, that's the God of whom I am pleading to, the one who has mercy towards us. He continues, he says, with these things prepared like this, the priests enter the first room repeatedly, performing their ministry. But the high priest alone enters the second room, and he does that only once a year, but never without blood, which he offers for himself and for the sins the people had committed in ignorance. The Holy Spirit was making it clear that the way into the most holy place had not yet been disclosed while the first tabernacle was still standing. This is a symbol for the present time during which gifts and sacrifices are offered that cannot perfect the worshiper's conscience. There are physical regulations and only deal with food, drink, and various washings imposed until the end of the new order. And he says, but Christ has appeared as high priest of the good things that have come in the greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands that is not of this creation. He entered the most holy place once for all time, not by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, having obtained eternal redemption. And so he says, you have to understand how the tabernacle worked. You have to understand the priesthood and how it worked in order to understand what Jesus Christ really did. And as we look back through Christ, through the cross, through what he did, what you see is that the priests would go in and do their duties the high priest, one, the highest of all priests, would go into the Holy of Holies one time a year, never by himself. 
only with blood because it came as the sacrifice to present the sacrifice. And what the writer of Hebrews is reminding us is he says that Jesus Christ appeared as that high priest, that he went through the holy place into the holy of holy place. He did not bring blood of goats and calves. It said that he brought his own blood as perfect sacrifice, that he himself has moved into that place. And because Jesus did that, he says that there's an eternal redemption that is now offered. What was temporary in the, in the blood of the goats and the calves now is, is permanent because of his perfect sacrifice. That's what Jesus Christ did as the high priest. That's chapter 9. Flip over to chapter 10. He continues with this perfect sacrifice. But let's pick up, let's pick up in verse 19. Because what the writer of Hebrews is doing is saying, this is not just something cool to think about, but there's actually a response that comes as a result. And this is what he says in verse 19. He says, therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have boldness to enter the sanctuary through the blood of Jesus. Stop and think about that. What the writer of Hebrews is simply saying is that we have boldness. That means you don't have to like kind of I don't know, but to walk confidently into. He says, we have boldness to enter the sanctuary through the blood of Jesus. That the place where only a high priest could go once a year, we have access to all the time. That we ourselves could go into the presence of God because Jesus has made the way. He's taken down the dividing wall that it's through the blood of Christ that we can go into the presence. And so what David is raising his hands towards, we actually have access to, to be able to go into the presence of God with our, with our prayers and our pleading. He says in verse 20, is inaugurated for us a new and living way through the curtain, that is through his flesh. And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart, in full assurance of faith with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed in pure water. Let us hold on to the confession of our hope without wavering since he who promised is faithful. Let us watch out for one another to provoke love and good works. There is a response that happens. He says that we can draw near to God. David's like, I'm praying towards the place where I know God is that I do not have access to. He says that we now as believers in the same regards, we can actually get into the presence of God through the, through the body, the sacrifice, and the blood of Jesus Christ. And so he says, let us not neglect that. Let us not just uh, assign that to someone else. Say that's something that pastors can do, but I can't. That every believer of Jesus Christ who is in this room, who is saved, have access and can draw near with confidence, with boldness. That changes our prayer life. If I understand that, then all of a sudden, I now have a supercharge to my prayer life. And so let's do that. Let's take what has been given to us by Christ and lift up our hands toward God in his place. Let's lay down our pride that helps us and tries to get us to believe that we don't need that kind of help from God, that I'm good on my own. Let's lay down the fear of what others will think or that we're afraid that we're not enough, that we don't have what it takes to come to God in the same way. Let us lay those down so that we can draw near to God with boldness with confidence, just as David does. He continues that not only is he pleading with God to hear our cries as we should, he's also now praying in this psalm that we, he's praying that God would distinguish him from the wicked. And we should this be the same. Look what he says in verse three. He says, do not drag me away with the wicked, with the evildoers who speak in friendly ways with their neighbors while malice is in their hearts. Repay them according to what they have done, according to the evil of their deeds. 
repay them according to the work of their hands, give them back what they deserve. Because they do not consider what the Lord has done or the work of his hands, he will tear them down and not rebuild them. It is important to understand when he's talking about the wicked, David is not talking about people who just commit sins. Because if he was talking about that person, then he would have to be himself in the same place. And he'd be talking about all of us. Scripture is very clear that even those who are faithful sin against God. When he's talking about the wicked, what he's talking about is those people who actively oppose God, who are coming against him, and not only opposing God, but oppressing his people with deceit, with treachery. It's the ones who divides evil in their hearts. And that's why he's saying, don't assign me the same place of the, where they're going to go. He was basically saying, you know, it's bad to go to Shoal. I don't want to go to that place. But ultimately what's worse is that if you, if you just consign me to the same group, like if you just associate me with them, that's equally as bad as if the place where I have to go away forever. He says, I don't want to be associated with what they do, because this is what the wicked do. They smile really, really pretty, but inside they're just, they're looking for ways to destroy. And so that's where he talks about their works, right? Okay, the works, the evil deeds that they do, and why that God should repay them according to what they've done. And in the same way, they, they are neglecting the work, what the Lord has done, and the work of his hands. And so you see this contrast going on, the works or the effects or the, what they're doing as wicked and what God is doing and how they do not line up. And so in this prayer, he's like, don't associate me with those who are coming against, who are coming against the righteous and the faithful. And so in this prayer, this is a reminder for us because we live in a day where, we, where I think David would be praying this a lot. Because when he's talking about, don't drag me with those who are trying to come against, where it's of malice against your people, okay, what they're doing and the evil deeds that they're, they're doing. Imagine if David lived today, he'd go, yep, that's, that's what I'm praying for, right? That we live in an age where anti-Semitism is rising. That those, you, if you read the news, that Israel herself is surrounded by the wicked, the one whose whole purpose and whose whole heart is to devise evil and to destroy and to kill his people. That's what he's praying against. They're saying that those wicked coming against me, coming against you, that is what don't assign me to those. And so now as church, as we read this prayer, as we listen to David pray, and as we pray too, this is not just the wicked who come individually against us. That we too need to continue to pray that the wicked coming against his people Israel, the Jewish people, that we need to pray that they would not be swept up by the wicked. And so I just, just as your pastor, continue to exhort you that we must continue to remember and to pray for them. Because again, what God wants in this time is for his people to turn to him, to give their hearts to him. Just as we talked about, to raise their hands to him. That is what his desire is. While at the same time protecting them against the evil that tries to overcome them. If you haven't prayed for the nation of Israel, I encourage you, start today. Start today. Because what we see here is divine vindication. John talked about it in Psalm 26. Okay, that this is God repaying to what they've done. As a righteous judge, that what they deserve, they will get. And notice what he says is that, that when they don't consider God's works, God's hands, and he's going to tear them down. And he won't let them rebuild. 
uh, our growth group is reading through Genesis. And so last, last week we were talking about Genesis 11 and the Tower of Babel. The works of man. They, just, they devised in their heart that they were going to make themselves like God. And so this picture of God tearing down and not letting them rebuild, that God didn't come down and manually, brick by brick, tear that tower down. But what he did is he saw what was in their hearts, and so he confused their language so that they could not continue the work, and they were never able to do so ever again. So that God himself came against them, and that's what he's saying here, that David is saying is that when the Lord's going to come against, it's not going to matter what they're going to try. They're never going to be able to rebuild what they were trying in the first place. So we too pray for, that we'd be distinguished from the wicked. And finally, at the end then, we should praise God when he answers our prayers. I mentioned at the beginning that we're really good, really good in desperation and saying, God, you got to do this. God, you got to help but so often we fail to get to the second part and saying, thank you, God, for helping. And so we see here now in verse, in verse 6, he says, Blessed be the Lord, for he has heard the sound of my pleading. See, the assurance that David has is that God has heard. And the assurance that he has that God will protect but notice he does not know when that answer is going to come, and he doesn't know in how it's going to be delivered. David simply says, blessed be the God, you are worthy of, you're worthy of who you are, because I know that you've heard me. David didn't have to know an answer to his, to his need, and he didn't have to know when that answer was going to come. It was enough to know that God heard him. Is that the same for you? Are you willing, when you pray to God, is it enough that God has heard your plea, heard your cry, heard your shout to him? Or is it only enough when you get the answer and when you know when it's going to happen and you have all the details? David didn't need all of them. And that's why he says it's enough, that God is enough, that not only is he rock as he started off with, but now he says in verse 7 that the Lord is my strength and he is my shield. We see saving power and protection happening. We see individually this act, these two parts of active power. We see him as my strength, the one that's going to help sustain and carry him through. If you jump down to verse 9, in the third portion, you'll see that he is also the shepherd, Cain, okay, active individual protection and power that he is a shepherd. I came across this quote from Charles Spurgeon that I, that I loved. It just really resonates. Look what he says. He says, my dear friend, if you can say, the Lord is my strength, you can bear anything and everything. You could bear a martyr's death if the Lord should be your strength. He could make a stalk of wheat to bear up the whole world if he strengthened it. Think about that. It's not just some empty thing like, okay, uh, what's some good... What's some good Christianese like prayer that makes it sound really like robust, like so it sounds really good? But what Spurgeon is saying is that if you can say with full confidence, the Lord is my strength, he says you can face anything. You can face anything. Not think I can face anything or maybe you think I can face everything. It says if you can come and with full full trust and full confidence, the Lord is my strength. It does not matter what comes against you. It does not matter if your life is taken from you, that you can stand there and take it because it's the Lord who's the one who has girded you with strength. That's an act of strength. But we also see too that he's defensive as well. You see, the Lord is my shield. Okay, and defensive, the shield most times is a defensive weapon. It's meant to protect from the blows of the enemy, arrows shot at you. Okay, you could hook them to many of them, you could hook together with others around you to form an impenetrable wall. And so he's also defensive power. And we see too in verse 8 that he's also a stronghold. 
and it's continuing. David is saying that these places that he's run to, right? Remember that David's wandering around, running around in the wilderness, and he finds himself in these strongholds in the wilderness. There are these protective, these caves with, with easy protection that has everything that they need, that he can run to and be safe. And that's what he says that the Lord is as well, that he is the stronghold of salvation. And so he says, because he's my strength, because he's my shield, because he's my shepherd, because he's my stronghold, he says, my heart trusts in him and I'm helped. See, he's helped by all that anxiety and all that fear and all that questioning and all the doubt. It says that because God is his strength, his stronghold, his shepherd, his shield, he says, I'm helped. And I don't have to face that anymore. And then Burry says, therefore, my heart celebrates and I will give thanks to him with my song. Again, he hasn't seen the answer yet. He says, I'm singing the song of praise because I knew God heard me. I know he's going to answer at some point. I know that he's going to do it because he said he would. I right now, it doesn't matter when that comes. It could be in 10 years but right now I can praise God because I know that he's heard me because in that I know that he hears me. This is what it's going to be. He is my defense. He is my active one working against. He is the offensive weapon that I have. And so therefore all I get to do and all I have to do and all I want to do is to give him thanks. He's coming back full circle. And so are you there? in your situation, the one maybe you're waiting for an answer for, can you, like David, say, I praise you, God. I give thanks to you, God, because this is who you are. See, God hears us, he helps us, he holds us. But you see, as he wraps up this psalm, he doesn't just stop with himself. You see, David has real needs, Individually, this is what he's facing. But what he also says, he's like, I am not just one person. I'm not alone. I'm not by myself. And so therefore, in my prayer now, as I lift my hands to you, not only am I praying and asking for me, I'm asking for my people too. You see, you know, we see this all over. We see it in Daniel in his prayer. We see it in the Old Testament that so often that in the prayers to God that they're praying, when they're praying, that they're confessing sins of people. As Westerners, we struggle with this because we have, we have created culturally that I am my own fortress. I am my own people. It is me and me alone that I'm responsible for me. And it is very hard to think as Old Testament or even Testament writers who come from a corporate identity to a group mentality, that it's not just me individually, that I'm part of a family, I'm part of a clan, I'm part of a people, part of a nation. And that impacts and influences and affects the way that I live. And so as he's praying now, he says, the Lord is my strength. That is the rock that I stand on. But it is also the strength that my people need too. And so he is a strength of people. He is a stronghold of salvation for his anointed. It should not surprise us that the word anointed in Hebrew is Mashiach, which we get our word Messiah. And so he says, not only is it for his anointed, the Messiah of this people is the stronghold and strength of it. And so therefore, because I am part of this people, therefore, I am going to pray for them as well. And so he prays four things. He says, one, save your people. They need to be rescued and protected. He says, two, bless your possession. Other versions uh, translate possession as inheritance. I've put a number of scriptures on there, but what I want you to understand is that Israel, the nation of Israel, is God's inheritance. Some of you may have been privileged or blessed to have been given inheritance from uh, a family member or a grandparent, 
right? Something that's been, that's been established for you and handed down. That is a blessing to you. Scripture over and over and over and over and over again says that Israel is God's inheritance. And if Israel is God's inheritance, then you think he's going he's gonna to want possession of that. Most people don't look at inheritance and go, eh, I'm not really interested. No, nah, it's okay. Just, just give them to someone else. God has Israel in a different place. That he, it is, they are his inheritance. And so therefore, David is praying that God bless your inheritance. You see, they're the only nation or people group on the face of the earth that are identified as his inheritance. And what this does is it indicates their unique relationship with them. And that's why he says, you gotta protect them, you gotta save them. You gotta bless them. He says, you gotta shepherd them. Just like Psalm 23, you gotta feed them, you gotta care for them, you gotta watch for them. And then he says, you have to carry them forever. You see, God's people need God's constant sustaining presence. They need him to do that. David recognizes it. He says, I knew it. As my hands are going up, I know that I can. I need your sustaining presence. Lord, your people do too. And they've always needed it. And so now as the church of God, as we are praying, not only are we praying for our needs, are the needs of our family, but we also need to be thinking about the greater spiritual family. And remember that as the church that Paul has told us that we've been grafted in, that we've been brought into that. And so therefore it is our responsibility to be praying for the people of God, not just for the church. You see, we live in an age too that people are believing the church has replaced Israel. That is a lie. Israel is God's inheritance and always will be. And so now our responsibility is to pray for, to support, and to lift up the nation of Israel so that the Jewish people can know Messiah. That is our responsibility. And so scripture is clear. David is on his knees. He's lifting his hands. He's praising God. He's saying, God, you are the answer. You are the source. You are my strength. And so we do too. We must come before him. Helpless. Broken. But with confidence because of Christ. Let's move into that place. Let's follow the way that he's made for us. So not only can we see and know that God has heard us, but that he can hear our prayers for his people, the one he cherishes. Amen. Father, we just lift this time to you. We praise you for Psalms. We praise you for David's heart. Lord, may we, be, may we be a people who pray in such a way that we recognize that it's with you that that's the only place we want to be. If you're here this morning, I want to spend just a moment to explain this thing once again. What you may not understand is that, that Jesus doing what Jesus did, that moving into that place as the priest on behalf of the people, that Jesus doing so as a perfect sacrifice, the way that he made through his body, which was broken on a cross, he did that so that the dividing wall between God and man would be taken care of. What I want you to understand is this, is that that dividing wall was the sin that's present in each one of us. Every person in this room has a sinful nature. We're born with it. What it is, it's that desire to do what we want to do to rebel against God. And, and it's that thing that, that has separated us from him. And should we die in that state, it says that we'll be separated from God forever but Jesus made the way. And what I want you to understand is that if you've never placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, believing that your sin, all the wrong that you've done and ever will do, could be forgiven, 
if you never place your faith in realizing that that can be removed, washed clean, and that you can have eternal life with God and live with him forever and ever, then I want you to understand that is what God is offering to you now. That scripture is clear, that it's only placing faith in Christ because he is the way, he is the truth, and he is the life. No one comes to the Father except through Christ. And so it doesn't come by believing in God. It doesn't come in through religion. It doesn't come through good works. What it is is a, saying, I am a sinner, and, I'm, and I deserve wrong. God, I believe. I know that's who I am, but I believe that Christ died so that I might be forgiven. So Lord, wash my sin clean. And Lord, I know that Jesus didn't stay dead when he died, but that he came back to life. That's eternal redemption. And there's eternal life. So Jesus, forgive my sin. And I take the gift of salvation. Lord, and I know that doing so allows me to live with you forever and ever. And so if you've not made that decision, it's that simple process, that simple prayer to just admit and acknowledge before God and to receive the gift that he's given you. For us, as we finish Psalms this summer, whatever it is you're facing, today is the day. Maybe you just need to get on your hands. Maybe you need to get on your knees. Maybe you need to lift your hands up. Maybe now is the time where we begin to just come before God and say, God, I cannot take another step. I do not have the strength to continue. And so, Lord, I need you to be my strength. Maybe it's here in this time of reflection that you just establish the confidence that you need, the boldness that we can before God. Maybe what it is is, is that you've not considered or taken seriously the place of God's people, Israel, in God's heart. And so in this time, I encourage you, pray for Israel. Pray for their leaders, pray for their people, pray for their protection. Pray that they would turn and acknowledge God and acknowledge the Savior. And so let's pray for them. And so now in the quiet of this worship, for the next minute or two, let's just reflect before God.